My dearly beloved in Christ, today is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, but it is also the feast of a wonderful saint, Saint Mary Magdalene. And I believe that Saint Mary Magdalene is one of the greatest saints in heaven. In fact, it is very interesting that not only did our Lord appear to her after his resurrection, but one of the evangelists mentions that she was the first to whom our Lord appeared. Of those that are recounted in scripture, she was the first. And why such privilege that our Lord gave to her? Because she was so faithful in loving and serving him. She was there with our Blessed Mother and a couple of other holy women at the foot of the cross when he died. Now we also know that St. Mary Magdalene had been a great sinner, a very great sinner. But when she boldly went in, not caring about the jeering of those who were with our Lord at table in the Pharisee's house, when she boldly went in right up to his feet and knelt down, and it says in the gospel she washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, is how she wanted to show her contrition and her love for our Lord. And he said, many sins are forgiven her because she has loved much. And our Lord also said, wherever this gospel is preached, that which she has done shall be told in praise of her, shall be recounted. So St. Mary Magdalene is a wonderful saint, and she is also a reminder to us that there are two kinds of saints. There are saints who loved and served God from their youth and perhaps never even lost their baptismal innocence. We would look at such saints as St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, the Little Flower, or St. Dominic Savio, St. Aloysius, and many others like them. So there were those who were innocent and always loved and served God. And on the other hand, there are the penitents, those saints who perhaps for a period of time and maybe even for many years lived apart from God as enemies of God, offending Almighty God, but then repented and were converted and began to love and serve God. And they remind us of the fact that it is not a question of how many sins a person has committed, but how deeply and sincerely the person repented, number one, and number two, how and in what manner he or she changed his life from that point on. It was often said by our Lord's enemies that he eats with sinners. He loves sinners. But to be accurate, we should say our Lord loves repentant sinners because we remember what he said to the woman who had been caught in adultery and was about to be stoned to death and when they asked him what should be done he said let him who was without sin cast the first stone and when they all began to drop their stones with shame and leave he then said to her has no man condemned thee and she said no man lord and then he said neither will i condemn thee Go and sin no more. And we must remember those words of our Lord. Go and sin no more. So repentant sinners are loved by our Lord. And there are a number of examples of such great saints. St. Mary of Egypt, St. Augustine, St. Margaret of Cortona, many others, who had been even great sinners, living even for years in sin, but then they repented and they completely changed their lives and became great saints. So they are an encouragement to us that everyone can become a saint. Everyone could become even a great saint if we will it and do what is necessary and give up the occasions of sin and live lives of prayer and self-denial and observance of God's commandments and love and serve him for the remaining years that God gives us in this world. So let us honor St. Mary Magdalene today and call to mind the words of our Lord who loved her so much that many sins were forgiven her because she loved much. Let us strive 
to love much, to love and serve our Lord as he deserves. Now, the gospel for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost is the gospel of the prediction of our Lord of the destruction of Jerusalem. And several years ago, I gave a sermon on this Sunday in which I recounted in detail the events of the war with the Jews by the Romans, began, I think, in the year 67 or 68, and then concluded finally with the siege of Jerusalem, and then the Roman armies entered the city and the destruction of Jerusalem. And those details are recounted by a Jewish historian named Josephus, or Josephus, as many pronounce his name. And he was allowed by the Roman general to travel with the army and was a tremendous historian and wrote down in great detail what took place. And what happened is when the Romans came to Palestine to finally subdue the rebellion of the Jewish people, they started in the north in Galilee and worked their way south, one city after another. And consequently, the people fled to Jerusalem. Their trust was in Jerusalem. It was a walled city. And so when the Roman army finally arrived at Jerusalem, all these people had fled to the city. Not only was Jerusalem a very populous city, but the population now had surged tremendously by all of these refugees who had come from other cities and towns seeking safety in the city. And it is frightening to read the story that Josephus recounts of how there was such tremendous hunger in the city because of the siege. The Roman army literally surrounded the city. They dug a ditch around it so that no one could go in or out and basically gradually starved the city to death. But eventually then when they went into the city, the final battle took place at the temple. The Jewish soldiers had fled to the temple and that's where the final skirmish took place. And then accidentally, even though the soldiers had been told to spare the temple, which was so beautiful, literally a wonder of the world. Even though that was the case, one of the soldiers accidentally in the skirmish knocked over a lamp, which lit on fire a curtain, and then the whole temple went up in flames. And then literally, our Lord's words were fulfilled that not one stone was left upon another as the entire temple was reduced to rubble in that fire. But again, it's a frightening thing to read. And it reminds us of the terrible consequences of rejection of grace. Now, there's an old Latin saying. You've likely heard it before. And it goes like this, corruptio optimi pessima. And what it means is, literally, the corruption of the best becomes the worst. So, Another way of putting it is, the more grace God has given to us, the more we are responsible for. And someone who has been given a lot of grace and doesn't live up to it, doesn't correspond with it, will fall even worse than another who had not been so favored and will have much more to answer for. After Vatican II, people said, well, how could the priests go along with these changes? They were educated, the religious, the nuns, the priests, taking off their habits, leaving the priesthood, getting married, and so on and so forth. How could that happen? Corruptio optimi pessima. The corruption of the best becomes the worst. And we also have been given many graces. And we must remember the importance of corresponding with those graces. Our Lord loved his people, the Israelites, the Hebrews. He wept because this city was going to be destroyed. He stopped on the Mount of Olivet, overlooking the city. This was actually on Palm Sunday that this took place. He stopped and he looked at the city and he wept over it because he knew what was going to happen. And then he gave this prophecy. And our Lord said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children as a hen gathers her young under her wing, but you would not. And so he predicted its destruction, and eventually that took place about 30-some years later, 37 to 40 years later, 
and it was terrible. It was frightening. But it was the final outpouring of God's just wrath upon this people for rejecting our Lord, putting Him to death, rejecting His teaching, and all of its crimes. And so it is a lesson to us that God is patient. He allows Himself even to be offended, but only for a time. And eventually, the punishment comes. God's justice will eventually win out. So let us, reflecting upon this terrible tragedy of the destruction of Jerusalem, call to mind the importance of corresponding with the grace that has been given to us, not wasting it, not abusing God's grace, but making use of it to grow in virtue and holiness, and reminding ourselves that each of us can become a saint. Just as St. Mary Magdalene, who had sinned very much, changed her life completely and became a great saint, so we too can become great saints. And I will conclude by pointing out the words of St. Paul in today's epistle, where he says that God will give us the grace to overcome every temptation, that no temptation will be so great. His words, God is faithful and will not permit you to be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also give you a way out that you may be able to bear it. In other words, God will always give us the grace we need to conquer every temptation. Let us remember those words and have that trust in the love of the sacred heart of Jesus that he will give us all that we need to become saints and even great saints. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.